one of the things we're really interested in is, is the public pensions as indicative of a broader question around American retirees. Because right? we are facing something that's relatively unprecedented. California is somewhat of a unique picture. When I was born in the state of California, there were 19 million residents. Today, there's roughly 46, if I have my math correct. But we don't think that's going to grow that much anymore. The type of growth that we experienced over that time period, which was, I think it was born in 1500, but it's not quite that long, but we've slowed down dramatically. And suddenly the pensions, the promises that were made in an environment of extraordinary growth are becoming due. How as a legislator do you think about the obligations that the state has incurred, our ability to meet those, and simultaneously the obligations to the taxpayers to not place a too onerous of a burden on them as we try to resolve this, this crisis? Big questions, yeah. big answers. Um, I, I served on our retirement board for 12 years, one of the 200 top retirement systems in uh, the nation uh, while I was the county treasurer tax collector. Um, there was a bill in 1999 called SB 400, uh, which passed on the last night of session, which is usually when all the garbage kind of gets passed here in California. And it said for CHP officers, you have a formula that's 2% at 50 when you retire. So if you're making 100,000 at age 50, and you've been there 25 years, the math works out and you get 50,000 a year, one half. And, and, and they changed that formula from 3% at 50 to, it's from 2% at 50 to 3% at 50. So all of a sudden now you're making 75,000. But they never funded for it. They made it retroactive to the data higher. So when your pension plan was fully funded in a roughly 2,000 because of the dot-com boom, it now was two-thirds funded. Right. And you don't do that to a defined benefit pension plan. You do not change the formulas. You, at least don't go retroactive. You, you may want to go prospective, but you would then make the participants pay a little more for their share. So we created this massive unfunded liability, and we're still looking at, after all these years later, but what, 70% funded? We're still at two-thirds right. funded. So we're relying on yields from the marketplace, which are supposed to exceed 70, 7% per year. That's kind of tough to do, especially when you have interest rates that are so low, you're relying so much on equities. I think maybe California has been lucky the last four years that the stock market's gone up 50% since Donald Trump was elected president. You know, kind of lucky it's kind of deferred the problem, but we're seeing cities, because CalPERS, the state's largest uh, pension plan system is slowly reducing the investment assumption from seven and a half to seven uh, they're seeing their contributions then go up because the, when you do the math, if you re reduce your assumption, then your liability goes up and then you therefore have to have a larger contribution for your unfunded portion. And, and so now cities are, are struggling. They're raising sales tax. School districts are struggling, even though Prop 98, which provides 40% of the state's revenues to schools, it's still not enough. So a train wreck is coming and there are telltale signs everywhere. Cities asking to go beyond the sales tax limit and raise their sales tax even higher just to try and meet their budget. So we've got something on the horizon and we've got a state, if I could keep going, no, Mike, please. That's, that's got what, this year $21 billion surplus, next year 7 billion, Well, you can kind of see that trend, or maybe next following year a minus 14 billion, but giving nothing really to the cities and schools to try to start undoing or unworking this, this massive juggernaut that's coming down the road. Well, and, and the state of California also has a unique dynamic with Prop 13, right? Where the ability to raise property taxes on the value of properties is limited to a stated inflation rate, right? Or a, a 2% 2 max. max. CPI has been running below that, so I actually believe it's less than 2% is my understanding. If, if, if CPI is less than it is, then the number uh, percentage is less, right? Yeah. So, when you think about that type of dynamic where the liabilities that have been guaranteed and then expanded under SB 400, as you pointed out, and that has continued, right? We've not entered into any form of restructuring where we've reduced the pensions. Um, you, what you're referring to on the unfunded dynamic is those liabilities are pretty much set in stone. And then the, the question is how much do we need to contribute based on our expectation of what our future earnings are on the assets that have been invested. Correct. 
bonds are somewhat straightforward. It's difficult to argue that they'll deliver returns well in excess of existing yields. Equity has become that flex point. And so CalPERS, for example, just announced in the last year that they were actually going to increase their allocation to equities in the hopes that that would offset the decline on the bond side, right? So we're effectively speculating even more to try to meet those obligations. When you think about how this ends, right, where does it stop? Does it stop with us miraculously earning the returns that are required to keep this funded? Does it stop with us deciding that we need to restructure these obligations? Does it stop with bankruptcy? It's probably bankruptcy um, because the majority of the legislators in Sacramento are registered Democrats. And they are lucky to get into office because the public employee unions fund their campaigns. And the public employee unions will not allow for any changes in the current formulas or structure of CalPERS. They are relying on door number one, which is that investment returns will take care of the problem. And, and up to, to now, they've sort of been relying on that theory. But once the stock market levels out or declines, uh, we'll start seeing negative returns We'll start seeing larger requirements for contributions, and we'll be seeing recessionary uh, effects of a, of a down economy where the revenues are also declining. So how do, you, how do you deal with declining revenues and increasing expenses? We've already seen cities that are reducing their workforces by 25%. So we're seeing a decline in law enforcement, fire safety. Now, you know, that, that'll be magnified. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be ugly. It'll be bankruptcy time. It'll be Detroit where you have to go to a federal judge and say, we're going to reduce the benefits to our retirees. It won't be pretty. It'll be ugly. Uh, but going back to Prop 13, Prop 13 was approved in 1978. It predates 1999. And it predates 2004 when Arnold Schwarzenegger said, we'll give the property taxes to the counties and cities and we'll take the sales tax and, you know, it's called the triple flip. And, you know, as he's trying to deal with that, that recession uh, in, the, in the mid 2000s, the liquidity crisis, the big short, et cetera. And, and so I don't know if we sit here and put, a, put Prop 13 in the equation as a problem. It has certainly for counties been a steady revenue stream, whereas personal income tax revenues for the state represent two thirds of the revenue for the budget. And one half of that two thirds, one third of our revenues are generated by 1% of the population. Wow. They create, it, it, it's our wealthy residents. We don't give them fruit baskets every year to thank them for the amount of money they're paying. They have taxable income well in excess of a million dollars. But if they stop selling stocks and enjoying capital gains, then the state will feel it rather quickly. So we don't have like Prop 13, we've got this revenue stream that just keeps going. Personal income tax does this. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have a rainy day fund, but is it adequate? I mean, if LA Unified School District cried uncle because they just had to put $15 billion of unfunded retiree medical on their balance sheet because the Government Account Accounting Standards Board requires it. You know, if they come to the state for a loan, our rainy day fund is gone with just one school district. Granted, it's like the largest in the state, but we've got some serious fiscal concerns. You hit on a number of really important points there. One, um, you highlighted the idea of the fragility of relying on such a small fraction of the population. New Jersey just saw this with a single individual, David Tepper, leaving moving New to Jersey Florida. and yeah. moving to Florida, yeah. which represented, I believe, almost 3% of the revenue. Had to have Jersey. a special right. session hearing to talk about yeah. it. I mean, that's extraordinary when you think about it. That type of risk is very clear. And with the mobility, particularly of the technology billionaires um, out of Silicon Valley, um, that, I would agree, is, is a fragile uh, uh, system to rely on. The second thing that you brought up is this idea of, of the school districts and the need to invest in the next generation of Californians, right? And on my way here to Sacramento, I passed, you know, as I come into Sacramento, I passed one of the numerous homeless camps, Hoovervilles, I think they call them, that's not true, but that's certainly what they appear to represent. We don't have the resources to invest that because we're so busy paying for these past promises. Is there anything that we can do to change that? 
Well, we certainly have to figure out something and, and soon because we're crowding out other services. So uh, I try to bill just to show you how fun this is. I said, look, why don't we uh, limit the amount of the annual COLAs to retirees until the fund is at least 80% funded. That way everybody shares, you know, employees, employers, retirees. And, and that was killed. The number of union representatives that lined up against my bill was amazing. But the real answer is we've got to start going to a defined contribution plan going forward. Now, we have a model. Jerry Brown and Janet Napolitano sat down, and for the UC system, uh, any new hire has the opportunity to, to select defined benefit or defined contribution, which is your 401k traditional uh, plan. 37% of new hires have adopted the, the 401k plan. Why? Well, it's portable. They can take it with them. Two, they don't want to pay the high amount of contributions into the defined benefit plan because they're young and they want to pay for a house, they want to pay for childcare. They don't want a, a massive pension at a young age. So we have an opportunity to, to make some changes, but defined contribution, those two words are anathema to public employee union leadership. You just can't even whisper those words and they're gonna go apoplectic, but that's what's gotta be done. But watch every budget cycle, the Democrats are trying to kill the UC defined contribution plan, but that's where we've got to go. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because a lot of the work that I do is actually on the vulnerability of the defined contribution plans. Um, they're very much subject to mark-to-market -to -market risk. Effectively, you think you have a certain amount that is set aside, but you are increasingly reliant on your ability to sell at those prices. And with the sort of demographic bubble that we have in the United States, and California is actually even more extreme in some ways on this dynamic, you're looking at a situation in which that's not entirely clear that that can happen, particularly under the current technology. But I, I agree with you that the fixed liability structure of a defined benefit plan becomes extraordinarily difficult. It's also amazing, though, to think that people would turn down that opportunity, given the underlying value of that sort of guarantee coming from a near inviolable state, right? It's extraordinary to me that people would, would, would refuse that for the portability dynamic. Um, and you don't have the risk. Like you just said, your 401k could languish, right? Stock markets doesn't do anything, you're kind of stuck, right? You might right. as well keep it in a money market fund, which isn't doing anything either, either. But at least your principal's intact. But with a defined benefit plan, you're putting all the risk on the taxpayers. Yep. And so, you know, what, what, what is that? I mean, Peter Drucker said what, over 50 years ago, a defined benefit plan wouldn't work unless the employer could be guaranteed that it would continue in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And government's about the only thing that, that does that, right? Until it doesn't, until it hits the wall. We're watching Illinois, we're watching Puerto Rico, we're watching New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, just states that are just ready to get real close to the implosion factor. Illinois, just like California, is enjoying a mass migration out. People just don't wanna you know, put up with it. So Chicago is having its issues. So, you know, it's, it's going to be real interesting to see how it all plays out and who's going to be responsible. If you own a home in your city, your city implodes, are they going to send you a note and say, hey, guess what, you own this percentage share and your family should contribute $10,000 to help us get to zero in our funding. And it's very easy for us to, to, to view that type of notice and say, there's no way I'm going to pay, right? But at the same time, those states and counties have the ability to attach it to you in the form of a property tax, or right? a, a lien, special charge, yeah. a lien, that you can't get rid of unless you're willing to forfeit your property. Right. right? So we're looking at extraordinary power at the state government.